All right, good morning, everyone. We're just after 1030. So I'm very excited to welcome my first um, in-person students on the BMINES group. Um, I'm Mercedes Bai, and I'm an education coordinator um, here at CLS. So today I am welcoming you, Nellie McClung and Fort Richmond Collegiates from Manitou and Winnipeg, Manitoba. And the students here are going to talk about um, heavy metal biosorption in white rock fungi. So I will not do a line acknowledgement since that's part of the student's presentation. So I will leave it to you guys. So let's welcome the students. Thank you so much, Mercedes. Please thank you for coming. All right, thank you all so much for attending our Students on the Beamline project. <laughs> it was working this morning. All right. Huh? Make sure you might not do it. It's the only one you have first time. Well, it wouldn't be a program without technical difficulties. Okay. <laughs> All right. Again, thank you so much for attending our Students of the Beam on the Beamline project run by Forrestman Collegiate and Nellie McClung Collegiate. Hello, my name is Mata Simpuya. My name is Jing Chen Liao. My name is Andrew Lee. My name is Owen Bo. My name is Leonardo Chong. I'm Kirtan Krish. And I am Tony Wong. And for the past year plus, we have been tirelessly and passionately working on a project looking at how a fungus can be used to decontaminate uh, aqueous solutions and remediate them from heavy metal ion contamination. Now, before we move on with our project, it is absolutely imperative we begin with a land acknowledgement. And so I invite my good friend Jing Cheng to do that. So we acknowledge that Manitoba is located on Treaty 1 territory and the homeland of the Anishinaabe, Anishinaabek, Dakota Oyate, Dene, Nihilwak Nation, Red River Mimiti, and the Northern Manitoba that include the ancestral land of the Inuit. We also recognize that the Canadian land source is located on Treaty 6 territory, which is the homeland of the Plains and the Wood Creek, Anishinaabe, Rock, Rock Mountain, Dene, Dene, Dakota Sioux, and the Sote, Soto, and the Métis Nation. We respect the intents of treaties and remain committed to work in partnership with First Nations, Inuit, and the Métis people in the spirit of truth, reconciliation, and collaboration. And let me welcome my student council presence to introduce the background of our experiment. Thank you, Jing Chang. So to begin our story, we must begin with the background. Now, who here has water and or coffee? Please raise it up. Yes, now what you have there, I think we all know is an incredibly important resource. We all rely on it to survive. Now, our world is covered in water. It's a blue planet, but of that water, only 3% of it is actually fresh. And of that fresh water, only, only about 1.2% we can actually drink. So naturally, this is an incredibly precious resource that we need to protect. Now, unfortunately, there is a myriad of ways that our drinking water can get contaminated. Uh, one way is by heavy metal contamination due to ions. Let's talk a bit more about that. Heavy metal ion contamination. Now, metals are everywhere. We use it in agriculture, manufacturing, and a variety of other industries. So considering how widely they're used, it is absolutely inevitable yeah. that it ends up in the environment where it can cause a number of problems on its own, but from where it can also eventually get into our drinking water. So things like surface runoff, leaching, and a variety of other methods. Now, once it's in our drinking water, the drinking water is not very tasty. Now, but more importantly, it is quite dangerous for people's health. It doesn't take a very large concentration of things like nickel or copper to make drinking water harmful and which ingesting it can result in a myriad of health issues like gastrointestinal issues, motor neuron issues, and several other things. Now, the three uh, metal ions that our project focuses on are copper 2+, plus, nickel 2+, plus, and zinc 2+. Plus. And to speak more about these horrible, horrible atoms, I invite my esteemed colleague, Angela Lee. All right. So what are those three horrible, horrible atoms? 
will start first with the copper. It is the third most used metal in the world, commonly for the high conductivity and electricity and heat in the fields of constructions and electricity. And its most toxic form being copper two plus with dangerous ingestion levels at only two milligrams per liter. So like a tiny bit of sugar in your coffee. And an overdose of copper can result in inactivation of liver enzymes and vomiting of blood, blood and permanent damages in tissues. In aqueous environments, copper can contaminate the surface and ground waters, which are very important to human societies, and which will eventually go into our drink waters, the water bottles. As of 2023, copper pollution is becoming an increasingly prevalent problem globally in aqueous environments. Second, one is nickel. Nickel is used in modern metallurgies in various processes, such as producing metal alloys, electroplating, nickel cadmium battery for production, and as a catalyst in chemicals and food industries. The large amount of products that contain nickel um, determines that the pollution will be almost in everywhere in every stage of uh, our life. The large amount of this product unavoidably leads to pollute the environment at all stages of manufacturing, recycling, and disposing. The accumulation of nickel in the body through chronic exposure can result in various health effects, such as lung fibrosis, kidney and cardiovascular diseases, and cancer of the respiratory system. You'd only have to take one milligram per liter of nickel to be very, very sick. And zinc. Zinc may be used to varnish metals to prevent rust and array of products from rubber, paint, cosmetics, inks, and soaps, commonly in agricultural and chemical industries. Pollutions of zinc in water can become sources of runoff, waste sites, streams of manufactured wastewater, and even in domestic waters of our shower. You know. Zinc poisoning may cause low blood pressure, seizure, jaundice, fever, and coughing. High levels of zinc present, five milligrams per liter, and waters will cause health problems. So, decontamination and aqueous solutions. There are many different ways to remove contamination from water, such as those listed in our PowerPoint. But many of these methods are hard to maintain, high in cost, and most importantly, ineffective at low concentrations. For example, Second one on the left, adsorption. Um, it has the pros of high efficiency, low cost, and has the ability to deal with substances with high toxicity, but it does not function well under 0.1 milligram per liter of concentration. And the contamination we are dealing with is around 50% lower than that. That is why we had chosen the method of microremediation. Right. Now we'll pass it on to our honorable and much respected Mr. President. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an issue. Our drinking water is under threat from metal ion contamination, and the concentrations you need are that you need to get sick are extremely low. So where do we look for a hero in this time of need? Do we look to the sky? No, we look to the ground. <laughs> Let's talk about microremediation. Now, before we get onto microremediation, we need to discuss what bioremediation is. Bioremediation is the process of removing pollutants from soil and water using living organisms. Microremediation specifically involves the use of fungi for this. Now, this has a number of advantages wherein it's effective, economical, and most importantly, works at low concentrations. Fungi under microremediation have the exceptional ability to take up pollutants, including heavy metals, into their fungal mycelia, which in layman's terms are their roots, from which, uh, if depending on the contaminant, it can either accumulate them or even break them down through their enzymes. Now, what hero specifically are we looking for? It's this beautiful thing. A couple of months ago, we as students had the incredible opportunity to meet an exceptional living being known as Ganoderma lucidum or as we like to call it, Lucy. Now, Lucy is a type of white rot fungus, which in the bioremediation world is kind of a celebrity. 
White rot fungi are known for their exceptional abilities to take up heavy metals and accumulate them in their fungal mycelia, leaving behind fresh soil and fresh water and at very low concentrations. Now, there's a large variety of white rot fungi that have been studied, things like oyster mushrooms and Venera chiri chrysosporium. Gant lucy itself has been studied for its ability to remediate soil, but very scarce research has been done into whether it can do the same in aqueous solutions. If it can remediate soil, can lucy also equally effectively remediate our water? Does it have the same kind of affinity? Now, remember, the concentrations we're looking at are so incredibly small. We thought of how could we see if Lucy can uptake these those low concentrations? We thought of methods like colorimetry, electrolysis, but at such low concentrations, those differences are basically undetectable. But then we were given a ray of light, <laughs> quite literally. <laughs> we were given an incredible honor to use the only synchrotron in Canada at the Canadian light source, which fires highly focused light at samples such as x-rays, and the way that light interacts with the molecules of the sample can reveal its chemical properties. Now, we're going to talk about the specific technique we used with the synchrotron to, act, to chemically analyze Lucy. And to talk more about that, I introduce my brilliant comrade, Leonardo Zhao. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, it's finally my turn to talk. <laughs> the specific technique we are using here is called X-ray fluorescence. It is an elemental analysis technique accomplishable via synchrotron. Is that a good definition? No, we just use another big word to explain a big word. <laughs> what exactly is elemental analysis? It is an analytical technique applied in chemistry to determine elemental composition of chemical compound. This is how it works. There's an analytic crystal right here that provides the high accuracy and precision we want to achieve. More specifically, this analytic crystal, it has a known composition with fixed interplanar spacing of atoms within it. And it facilitates the differentiation of X-rays diffracted by the sample in investigation. It can detect concentration of trace elements compared to many other methods. It has a very, very high detection limit, and which is exactly what we need. Now, I would like to pass on to my great friend, Bro Kirtan. He gave me the one, that's a big deal. <laughs> um, so what exactly are we trying to find with this? Um, these are research questions that we were hoping to investigate. First of all, does Lucy even like the metals? Does Lucy uptake metals? That was our first question. And we were testing with copper 2, zinc 2, and nickel 2, as Angela had mentioned before. Um, and more specifically, in liquid substrates more than in soil samples, as I've done before. And then the second thing we wanted to research was whether or not this fungus expressed a preference for one of these metals. Um, and to talk a little bit more about what we expect to find, I'll pass it on to my good friend, Nuatong, to explain all the hypothesis. I hear why I'm asked for Kirsten to explain our question. As he explained, we want to find whether or not Lucy likes all the metals or which ones her food. So obviously, in order to do this research, our assumption, our hypothesis, I do need a guess, is that it will, she will uptake all of the metals. And then the second, second hypothesis is that we assume that, that copper will be in the highest concentration in the fungus because of back home research we did, which shows the same trend in soil samples. And now let's move on and give this one to our wonderful colleague, Kirsten. I got it again. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how we went about doing this. Uh, so let's go over our procedure. So the first step that we went, uh, that we uptook was uh, preparing the environment for the fungus to grow in. Uh, this was done using mason jars uh, because it provided a good combination of portability and various factors. Uh, these mason jars were filled with a liquid culture, which provides the nutrients for the fungus to grow. Uh, we also outfitted these mason jars with gas exchange filters, and we made sure to filter, uh, filter and sterilize these to prevent as much contamination as possible. Um, the sterilization occurred several times over a span of a couple of days, 
and uh, this provided the perfect environment for the commons to grow. Next slide, please. Uh, regardless of what you think these may look like, they are our samples, I promise. Uh, uh, so we prepared the environment for these samples to grow in, and uh, with great thanks to Dr. Hausner from the University of Manitoba, who is a microbiology professor of fungus, which is perfect for us and we really appreciated his help, provided an agar culture, which got us started. We took small pieces of the agar and dropped them into these um, environments and started growing these samples in the jars. Uh, there were 12 different uh, samples that we started growing and uh, they, were grow they were grown in a confined chamber, which provides a controlled environment for these samples, uh, such as controlling the humidity, the amount of light they get, and various other factors. Next slide, please. Uh, I would now like to hand it over to Jing Chang to present further how we proceed. So as Kirsten said, we have the juicy already grow up. It's time to test it. We introduce the metal solution inside. As we show up on the slide, we have three metal solutions, which is copper sulfate, nick sulfate, and zinc sulfate. It's 30 milliliters at 0 0.05 moles, as shown in the pictures. Identical mason jars are the Lucy's house. Which means, and <coughs> sterilization was being done by the same way previously, 20 minutes of boiling sessions for several times a day for three days. We, that we will introduce the matte solution into the, the Lucy and the five minutes of each under the film foot to eliminate, eliminate the contaminations. Triplicate each samples and produce a nine treatment culture and the six controls, which is the three metal group and the two control group. We will grow up the Lucy and put back in the conviral chambers that then grow up 34 more days under the same conditioning, a condition previously. Excellent. And after 34 more days waiting and we are ready to extraction. As this slide, as this picture is showing, is that we're cutting, take the, some, the mason jaw, which is Lucy's house out, and then we cut Lucy into the, into the field papers as it is here. And then we're drawing on the, the, the film hood, and the, it's, we use the maximum wind speed to join up uh, for 10 minutes. After 10 minutes drawing, we are able to transport the from the, this, this, this piece of the field, field papers to the small tube. As I will show you, this, this bit. So we will put the samples in this small tube and the cap pack up to here. So all, and all the equipment we use were heating up uh, <clears throat> over a uh, bouncing burners where I try to protect our dear Lucy or by our best. Yes. And the sample, and we're ready to come here. Well, synchrotron is not even advanced as some occasions, but I will, was still being so excited to come here for running out the samples. So first, we're preparing our samples, trans transport from the tube, as I showed you before, to these sample holders. So we place the sample in this hole in the middle and use captain tape both sides and to make sure there's no area going in and out for these several days. And finally, we'll prepare 15 samples on this, I mean, 15 sample holders actually, yeah. And under the assistance of the Mercedes, Miranda, Tracy, James Goring, Grant B, Miss Pai, Mr. Sakura, our school teachers, were able to use idea beam light. And also, also Mr. Dallas, I mean Dallas, and we're able to use ideal beam line to test all the samples. Then let, let me welcome my good friend Leonardo to introduce our result of the experiments. Let's take a look at our amazing results. Before we dive into our results, let's take a look at what does it actually mean, all these big graphs. Now, when you put your sample into the idea streamline, the machine, the machine produces a result like this. It is a graph of normalized photon count versus energy in electron volts. The x-axis is the energy output, and the y-axis is normalized by Rayleigh scatter peak. 
Next slide. Next, next click. And that is the Rayleigh scatter peak. More specifically, we are aligning all the different graphs to have a same height of this curve. And that is instructed by our wonderful mentor, Smith Wu. Now, we have normalized this. We know what the axes are. How can we tell what is the elemental composition of this substance? Each element corresponds to a certain pattern of a higher peak and a lower peak. Lower peak is generally of one sixth the height of a higher peak. And by comparing these patterns to our known data, we could tell what element that is. For example, this would be a copper. Here would be an argon, higher peak, smaller peak. Now, next slide, please. Let's dive into our data and introduce my good friend. Not introduce, let's re-invite my good friend. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad to be back on the stage. Um, go back once, please. Um, so I talked a little bit about what we were trying to accomplish with this project. Does anyone here remember what that first question was? No, too early in the Monday? I can find that very relatable. Excellent. Um, we were trying to find whether or not Lucy even likes these metals, because we didn't know that. We grew, the, we grew several samples of Lucy in the metal, but we still don't know whether she likes metals. Um, this, uh, we'll get into the copper samples in a, in a little bit, but this is just a control sample. This was simply Lucy grown without being exposed to any metals. We can see here the scatter peak, which appears and it's been normalized to the rally peak, but there's not much notable metals, which we can see visible here. Uh, next slide, please. But if we look at the copper samples, we can see very distinct peaks at where we expect to find copper at the corresponding energy levels. Um, these are both copper peaks, uh, and uh, as you can see, they're both at a approximately one to six ratio as Leonardo had mentioned. Slide, please. Uh, again, this is the control just for uh, further reference. Uh, next slide, please. And these are the nickel uh, sample peaks. Uh, you can see these are also approximately in that ratio, and we can tell they're nickel by looking at the energy level that they're at. Um, and then the next is the zinc, and here we do notice something interesting. Next slide, please. Um, now, most of the zinc samples were about in this range down here. However, one of the zinc samples has this abnormally large spike. Um, well, after talking with Dr. Hausner uh, from the University of Manitoba for a little bit, we theorized that as there were three different samples that were exposed to zinc growing in different containers, this particular sample of Lucy might have developed a certain mutation, which made it more, which allowed it to absorb more zinc than any of the other samples. Um, and if we go back one slide, please. We can see just uh, how, if we compare this scatter peak and the, uh, and this scatter peak, we can see just how much zinc it did absorb. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so that's just the data of the individual samples themselves. I'd like to introduce my good friend, Nurtong, to explain to you further. Thank you, Kirsten. As Kirsten has finished our analysis of the first question, does anybody still remember the second question? Oh. Okay, at least one of us does. So the second question is, uh, after knowing Tracy likes all three, all three medals, which, oh, Lucy likes all three medals. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I like them too. It's a different way. <laughs> after knowing that Lucy likes all three medals and uh, ions, which one is her favorite? Here, we can see one of the graphs, but can you notice something interesting about zinc, which gives the resultant quality? Didn't you hypothesize that copper would be at the highest? Yes, exactly that is one of the points, exactly. <laughs> As what Kirsten has mentioned, we find an abnormally high peak of zinc, which stresses our mind quite a bit as we were researching and analyzing data for over 10 hours yesterday, maybe two hours was spent on thinking about what, by the, to, how to deal with the same sample. And it's what we, after talking to Dr. Hausen as uh, as we explained, we concluded that this extra, extraordinarily high zinc sample is out of the question. It's very insignificant compared to the other two who show similar track. So we did something interesting by eliminating every single highest peak on our three metals. Here, it looks like that it fits our hypothesis, which is the copper having the highest concentration, zinc second, and nickel the least. 
And here we go. Uh, after, although we know our answer to our research question already, but could it be noise that the system also captures? Yes, we found interesting metals in our, in our results that we would never ex uh, we have never expected, which includes titanium, germanium, calcium, and iron. So what where did it come from? That's one of our questions, the problems that we face during our research process. So in order to fix this problem, we tried it different ways. And then we concluded that maybe it's the best try to see if it comes from the materials and the tools that we were using during the research processes. So we collected every single tool we sat in contact with the fungi, which includes the captain tape, uh, the placeholder, all the devices in the room, and then also our uh, mycelium pre liquid culture premix. After running them through the synchrotron once again, we found some interesting things, which so corresponds to what we were seeing in the actual data. We found titanium, calcium, iron, uh, which proves that these metals that we were not expecting did not come from the fungi itself, which explains that our research is actually done very roughly, and our sterilization is done very correctly. And then our research process is quite, uh, at least to our standard, quite correct. <laughs> also, to mention that there were no traces of copper, nickel, zinc, which is our test subject found in these metals. So it did not influence our result. <laughs> Okay, now finally, after over a year of planning and growing and researching, we finally come to our conclusion. <laughs> Here we go. Remember our hypothesis? We assumed, we thought that Lucy would like every single uh, element that we introduced. Yes, it did show this trend from our data show earlier. And they did follow our hypothesis that copper will have the highest concentration followed by zinc and nickel. Yes, I would think so. As represented by that, huh? anyway. And then now, uh, after, although this is done, our research is done very carefully, there must be some human errors that we cannot um, uh, mistake, cannot avoid. So let's introduce my very smart, highest smart in AP chemistry. <laughs> That's right, it's Owen. Thank you. No, I, I don't need that. There's no more confusing graphs, I promise. <laughs> uh, so, although we have done our best, as Tony mentioned, to protect Lucy, only if we can do the same thing with our drinking water, uh, there are sources of error that we cannot avoid. That's because we are not working in a totally germ free and dust free environment. There could be cross contamination and contamination from unknown sources when we transfer the sample. Age also plays an important factor in our experiment because when Lucy is growing, it hurt, no, sorry, she grew from the middle to the edge of the container, which means the edge of the container would contain a relatively smaller amount of metal because it has a younger age, it has less time to pick up the metal. And although we have triplicated our sample and did over 50 scan in cell X. It's still not a huge amount of sample size that we can eliminate all the external factors. So these are things that we can prove, uh, we can improve on in further researches. And why are these useful? What are the applications? Well, it's not only human that drinks water. Every living organism in this planet needs water. And runoff waters from factories could potentially contaminate, not potentially, could contaminate the environment so that uh, organisms like fish and even organisms that drink the water, like deer and beer, they would also be affected by the contaminated water. So using this method, we are able to recover the uh, this ecosystem to some extent. Also noticeably, the metal contamination is a huge problem in First, uh, in First Nation communities all across Canada. There's some research conducted by NIH, which uh, told us that in most Canadian First Nation communities, 
aluminum, uh, copper, uranium, they all exceed the safety standard. So using this cheap and effective method, we are able to eliminate those contaminations so people living in First Nation community can have clean tap water that they can drink. And now to wrap up this whole presentation is someone who have contributed and we have, have done a remarkable contribution to our research and also a great vocal player. Uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, Tony Wong. <laughs> oh, thank you, Owen. Uh, before I acknowledge everybody who helped out there, I have to acknowledge that the entire group in uh, one over a year process reached every week as we worked so hard on this project. We are, we are all very happy that we can come here and we are all very proud that we make this possible. Than this pipe in order to make this possible. And then now move on to our acknowledgement. We have to give a very big thank you to everyone who helped us, especially Dr. Hautner from the University of Manitoba for providing us with the original mycelium samples and leading us each every step of the way to make sure we don't go them back, make sure we're going them the right and correct way. And then now we also have to acknowledge a thank you to uh, Dr. Dr. Rui from Hunan University for providing us the advice on trying mycelium in the liquid solutions, which has never been dropped in research now. And then also, we have to thank everybody at CLS, especially uh, Tracy, uh, Miranda, uh, Mercedes, uh, Dallas, and James, who helped us all along the way in here, make, make, that, make this a very welcome experience for us. And most importantly, we have to give the biggest thank you to our own teachers, Mr. Sakura and Ms. Tai, for teaching us how to do every single step, helping us organize, helping us make our group together into a very like leadership center. So we are all very appreciative of what you have done for us. Thank you very much. Bravo, good job. Um, I'd like to give it to the audience, ask any if you have any science questions or any questions for the students. Um, Catherine, do you have one? Yeah, did you notice any difference in the health of Lucy in the metal solutions and in the control samples? We did actually, and it was quite remarkable. We noticed that the samples that have been exposed to metals actually had far greater growth than the control samples. So, it's important to realize that due to our small sample size, in order to see whether those metals actually did contribute significantly to the growth, we probably want a larger sample size and a more trials to see if there's actually any significant difference in that treatment. So that might be a subject for future studies. Any other questions? Um, yeah, so you, I, I actually really appreciate how you threw out the zinc data or you disregarded the zinc data. Are you pretty you probably acknowledge that you have to figure out what's going on there before you can draw any conclusions. So I just want to say, oftentimes when you see an outlier, that the uh, the impulse is to uh, draw some dramatic conclusion from the, the how fantastic this zinc information could have been, and it could have told you a big story, and you could have made something up. But instead, you were cautious. You realized that you have to. Uh, you have to double check that before you can draw any conclusions. So just want to say that's very uh, good job. And, and I want to ask you, how did you come to, to make that decision? Uh, we analyzed the, uh, the, norm, the, the ratio of the normalized all of these photon counting. That was quite extraordinarily long compared to all of the other data sets. It's almost like unbelievable. Then we consulted it with Dr. Hosner. He provided us some professional suggestions and advice. After further evaluation, we decided to disregard those anomalies. Do you have a would you have a plan to for how to address that or maybe another hypothesis that you could test to see if, if maybe there is something important there? I can, I can answer that question. <laughs> so uh uh, uh, regarding another hypothesis, for this particular sample, the uh, the look from the looks of it, qualitatively, it looks very different from every other ones. It showed a rainbow color inside of, inside of the standard uh, black, yellow, and white color. 
which is quite interesting. That's why we turned into Dr. Hosner to, oh, you can see it right here. Not that clearly, but this actually has a reflection of the gold color syndrome. So we turned to Dr. Hosner, and he explained that it might be a variation of genes uh, in the fungi itself. So if there were to be further research, we could actually, with the system of Dr. Hosner, of course, to see whether or not that's actually a variation of genes, and whether or not they actually have a tendency of always having a higher concentration of things which could be applied to our application for this. It's even more, uh, like it's even better than what we thought. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, congratulations. It was a very nice presentation. Um, I just have a question because usually when there is contamination in water, it's very rare that there is only one little. Um, so what? It's completely political. But if there is like the three metals in the water with the with UC, what do you think would happen in general? Would it be able to um, absorb all of them, or maybe like preferential pathway? I think that is a very great question. Uh, and I think, although we don't exactly know what's going to happen, but uh, we can predict that this, this might be one of the future researches where we can uh, take a step further in campaigning which metal is Lucy's favorite by directly putting them the same amount together in there and see which one is absorbed. Uh, so thank you very much for the question. Yes, and furthermore, we've picked those three elements because they are the easiest to get. Obviously, there is um, uranium in the ocean, but I think it wouldn't really be possible for us to bring <laughs> uranium into school. So those three are the most common ones, I, and we think it will be a great beginning for our, maybe perhaps a series of experiments. So just based on your experience with this project, for each of you, do you feel like you would like to do another similar project? And if so, what would your next step be after your results today? You want to go like one at a time? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Me personally, I would love to do another project on Lucy, especially investigating that outlier we saw before, because that was an incredible amount of the zinc absorbed compared to everything else. It was one hungry boy. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Hauser gave the possibility that it was a genetic variation. So doing a long-term genetic study to see if you could breed fungi that are more effective against different metals would be incredibly interesting. To me. So if I had to do another project on Lucy, that's what I would look at. Do you have any? Same as above. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would like to just because is such a great facility that we can use. And I think we can explore more possible solutions like what other metal can, maybe Lucy can take those metals um, more than copper. Like we can figure out many other things and uh, broader application. That's the, uh, the reason I want to carry on to, as I said, perhaps series of experiments. Well, I would be very pleased if I could have another opportunity further, take a step further this experiment. Maybe you do not know this. Lucy is not simply a mycelium. It is also a very important traditional Chinese medicine. And it has many medical effects. Most importantly, we have taken the contaminations from eastern area into the mycelium. What should we do next? How, what are the possible methods to dispense them and how can we produce this uh, fungus on a very large scale. I believe those are, uh, are those will be great questions for us for the investing. Uh, yeah, I would certainly like to continue working on this project. One of the things that most fascinates me is how exactly does Lucy do this? What is the structure of Lucy? What's allowing it to uptake copper more than it uptakes zinc or even the genetic mutation that happens? What's going on within the microbiome of Lucy itself? Um, and I believe from our tour that we did of CLS, I believe there are ways of doing analyzing what's in Lucy and pulling it apart and actually pulling it apart uh, yeah. and seeing what's going on in there. Uh, that's what I would say. Thank you. I think for me, I would like to emphasize that I also think views such as very interesting. I also like to uh, investigate more into 
what's going to happen after Lucy take up so much heavy metal. Of course, Lucy, Lucy is our friend. We don't want her to take too much heavy metals in herself, but in terms of the environment, where could we put it? Or are there any possible ways to dispose only the heavy metals instead of wasting so much energy and then going our samples and going a fun guy and replacing them over and over again? That's my idea for the well, so, yeah. For me, personally, well, I, I know that Lucy black metal this time. So I would like to try other metals. Instead of just do single, I will do multiple metal solution in one. Maybe especially I want to try some radioactive, but <laughs> possible uh, do some huge, I mean, high concentration radioactive. Oh. That's, that's exciting. <laughs> it's very exciting. Just yeah. not, yeah. Well, not, not. <laughs> under proper practice tactics, yeah, I will try to do some radioactive metal solution inside. Why not where it solve the radioactive pollution problems in a lot of nuclear power plants they're using like a nuclear weapons they are using like there's a like a new new near waste there is radio they are pretty radioactive. That's the things what I'm going to do. If I can, yeah, if I can, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> oh wait, I'm going to take the last question. Um, and those of you that have been to these before will anticipate what my question is, I'm sure. <laughs> you guys might not. So I know that, uh, first of all, I want to say great job, and I'm very proud of you. The difference between last night and this morning is quite <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> very, very good. Um, I know that most of you are in grade 12. I know that all of you are thinking very much about your futures and where you're going to go next for school and things like that. My question for you is, what did you learn in this experience over the last year, and for at least one of you, two years, <laughs> Um, what did you learn in this that you will take with you as you continue to work on your school and your career? And I'd like each of you to answer it, please. I learned so much over the past seven, past year about variables that you never think about before. When you first write up your experimental procedure, it looks like a linear process. Step one, step two, step three. But then you actually go into the lab and you think, hey, wait a second. Could this be a source of contamination? Could that be a source of contamination? How do I hold my pipette so that it doesn't become a source of contamination? <laughs> and then, Put your gloves on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's so many different things to take into account that I never thought about before. It was a very tunnel vision way of thinking. So I think over the past uh, several months, I thought to sort of broaden my view, see how side that tunnel and think outside the box on how we can have the most accurate experiment possible and increase the credibility of our results, which is exceptionally important. And as I intend to go into the sciences, I will definitely take that experience with me along the way. Um, I've just learned how important it is to have like a clear way of communication because at first, um, coming together with CLS, we didn't know what the beam lines were and some information were a bit confusing. So we went with projects and ideas that weren't exactly possible, of at least what we thought and we were told, but it was very interesting. But later coming back uh, and getting more information on beam lines, just to note, uh, just to be told that, yes, we could have done this. So yeah, just, clear communication and maybe even further research ourselves of what a facility can do. For me, because in the future, I want to be a physicist to do some research. So this is a great opportunity to uh, experience what being a physicist would be like, <laughs> which is very tired. I understand why, is there, why, why there's so much <laughs> coffee machine in this room. It's really tough. And yeah, I, I think, it's a great experience that I can um, sort of help me to decide my future career, like what kind of uh, business I want to be and how life being a business is like. So, yeah. Uh, I would like to say the most important lesson I learned from this experience is that organization and coordination is of no less importance than knowing the technical stuff. And in school, what we learn the most are solve for X, solve for Y, 
it's very heavy on the technical aspect, but not as much on these soft abilities like communicating with your colleagues and having a clear picture of what are you going to do and achieve and organization coordination. I learned a lot. Uh, and yes, I was thinking somewhat of a similar thing. We, I've personally learned, known about the scientific method of doing an experiment for maybe since grade five, grade four, for a very long time now. But a lot of the projects that I've done that use the scientific method are by myself. And communication is often not brought up when you're trying to use the scientific method. It's always get your hypothesis, do the testing, so on and on. Being at CLS with surrounded by experts at using the CLS and with my friends taught me the importance of not only understanding what the scientific method is trying to do, but how important communication is in every single step. Um, and further than that, just as a second point, uh, me personally, I didn't know much about what CLS was trying to do. I didn't know much about what the beam line was and what it was capable of. As I do attempt to go into the science as much like everyone else here, it opens up so many more exciting possibilities of like, I have, I get so many questions on a regular basis. Now, another tool I can add to my toolbox is, could this be run on beam line? So that's, those are the two main things that I'm going to take away from this experience, uh, this experience and use in my life. I think for me, there's, uh, because it's always been kind of my dream to come to something like a synchrotron. I never expected that I can achieve this dream so early on in my life before even going to university. But I think what I learned uh, the most is actually related to that. Uh, I was able to see how much people, how many smart scientists after learning for like 10 years for PhD comes here and then build this amazing system all together and then keep on advancing and keep on finding new ways to research to uh, make the most out of it. This is something I can sort of, I have never seen it in person, which is something I think is a very inspiring and also made my dream more realistic because I got to experience it for time. Um, for me, I mean, kind of thing, I'm, I got to kind of think thing of that. I mean, the kind of the communication style and how to wait how the CIS community has also work, but personally, most interesting, most important thing I learned is called how software works. <laughs> but I, mean, I don't really have time to talk, I don't have a chance to say the David. I mean, I have a chance to discuss with the James Gorham, how he operated the software David make. It's pretty, pretty fancy, I mean, my future job is kind of doing a software engineering or computer science stuff, so I'm, I got impression. I mean, I got impressions that the software that make that they that made by David is pretty good, and uh, how how they actually use Python language to actually uh, so coding the stuff, and the how how used to they use the code C, C language you things. And this first time I really saw the like uh, Linux six like yeah, that's it. Thank you all. Yeah. Just a minute, surprise, no surprise. I'm sending this question to the teachers. <laughs> How has this experience, what have you learned from this that you might take with you in your continued teaching career? <laughs> it's interesting seeing my students get into projects. But it's been quite nice having an opportunity to provide some soft skills and information and just see their opportunity to see how they tackle this huge leap forward. As you mentioned, yesterday's presentation versus today's, check that box off. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it just highlights again what students opportunities to stretch and to surprise you. That's something that's definitely considered. I probably can't talk about just that part. But I think because I'm so proud of it. So see, I can't do it. <laughs> but it, it's been a great experience. We really appreciated all the help and guidance that we've had. And and we're so lucky.
um, three of these students will now go on to present. Uh, Madison is going to Japan to present the project, and uh, Leonardo and Luotong will be traveling to Australia in December to present the results of the project. So we're hoping to increase the reach of synchrotron uh, research in other high schools. So we want them to model what you are doing here because we think it's a pretty fast piece. So thank you for the opportunity. All right, thank you all. I'd like to recognize that Angela attends a school two 